Hey, good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well today. Before we get into the message, I just want to take a minute and I want to pray for our nation. Uh, this week has been a very heavy week. You know, first of all, we've got the pandemic, and then on top of that, economic crisis, and we have uh, racial uh, division, uh, protests and riots, and it's just been a big week in America. And I'm looking for a solution that's above the earthly. I'm looking into the heavenlies for a solution. And I want to take our time today to come into unity around the throne and pray that God would release divine solutions for our nation during this time. So would you come into agreement with me? Papa, we just come before you and lift up the United States of America. What a beautiful country she is. But it's, there are still some flaws, and there are problems. There are issues that we have to address. And none of us has all the wisdom or knowledge we need to speak to these issues. But we know that before you even created mankind, you knew the kind of problems we were going to have to address. And you said that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of the Lord, and he will give liberally. So we cry out to you, Papa, that you would give us wisdom beyond our ears, that you'd give us knowledge and, and grace and understanding and strategies to deal with the situations that we're dealing with as a nation. And Lord, we honor you and we, we honor your creation, every person you created in the image of God. We honor creation, the earth itself, and we, we want to be good stewards over what you've given us. And in this moment, in this time, we're pressing in to have your heart for your people and for your world. And so Lord, we ask that you would just divinely instill grace to your people and then also instill wisdom to know how to deal with these situations in Jesus name we pray amen good morning everyone uh, we're in a sermon series called nourished and um, we felt like that the longer we got into the COVID-19 pandemic the more we sort of felt like we need to talk about self-care because we've been in it for a while and some of us are thriving right now and some of us are struggling right now I've made no bones about it. This has been a hard season for me. This week was, uh, was incredibly hard. It was not easy. But um, that being said, I'm trying to learn what the Lord's wanting to do in and through me in this season. And so the nourish thought process was how do we care for ourselves? And we've been using this blurb from Parker Palmer that said self-care is never a selfish act. It's simply good stewardship of the only gift I have. The gift I was put on the earth to offer others. Anytime we can listen to true self and give it the care it requires, we do it not only for ourselves, but for the many other whose lives we touch. And one of the things I've found is when I've run out of grace, when I run out of energy, when my energy's at a level two, I hide from people. It's really interesting. I was talking to my son yesterday, and, and he says when he gets stressed or overwhelmed, he just wants to be alone. But he's a thriving extrovert. He loves to be around other people. He gets energy off of being around other people. But you can carry so much weight or responsibility, or get so stressed out that you begin to hide from people. If I'm going to be the best me, I've got to take care of myself so I can give myself away instead of protecting myself. And so if that's you today, I'm giving you permission to take care of yourself. The, the Lord wants to give you away discriminately to certain people at certain times, but he wants to give you, give you away at your very best. So uh, two, three weeks ago, we talked about mental me, and we talked about our mental capacity, our mental health, is when we can process experiences and information in a helpful way that de-stresses us and helps us to focus and make good decisions. And then uh, two weeks ago, we talked about emotional me, how, how we can be aware of our feelings and express them in an age-appropriate manner. And then last week, we talked about relationally us, and we talked about that you can't really know who you fully are in the absence of the people God's put around you. God has put you in a family. He's put you in a clan. He's put you in a tribe. And as you function transparently within those relationships, they have the ability to be a mirror and reflect your brilliance back to you. Sometimes they reflect your weaknesses back to you so you can get better. But it's within community and relationship that we really find ourselves. There are some things that we are created to do all by ourselves. I can read a book by myself. I can entertain myself. But love has to be experienced with uh, someone else. Compassion, ha patience has to be expressed with somebody else. And there are some parts of our humanity we can't even experience outside of relationship. 
So now this week, we're going to pick up and we're going to talk about community care. Now that we are functioning in relationships, how do we function as a community church? And then how do we function as a church ministering to our community, building these relationships around us and advancing the kingdom of God through the local church? And I'm going to use two popular passages I've used before, but I love both of these passages. And then I'm going to show you a little thing the Lord showed me this week that I never saw before. I'm going to pick up in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 uh, is known primarily for its first five verses where the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the earth. Uh, but at the end of Acts chapter 2, the result of Holy Spirit being poured out on the earth is, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing them, the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So we see in the first part of Acts chapter 2, Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples. And then at the end of Acts chapter 2, we see signs and wonders and praying together and going to the, uh, the temple together. And then house to house and fellowship and breaking bread and then selling possessions and sharing all that they had. This is what the early church looked like. Then we go into Acts chapter 3 and the beggar is healed. And then in Acts chapter 4, the authorities go after Peter and John. And after they talked to Peter and John, towards the end of the chapter, Peter and John, they all began to pray. And when they did, it said the Holy Spirit filled the house. It shook the house. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit again. And then it says these verses. Now, though the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was called by the apostle Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. What we see in that passage is Holy Spirit's poured out at the beginning of Acts 2, and then the church begins to function as a church at the end of chapter 2. And then we see that persecution came against Peter and John, and as they prayed together with the church, the house shook with the power of Holy Spirit. They were all filled with Holy Spirit again, and the result once, once again, people caring for people and the local church. Here's what's really interesting. Last Sunday was Pentecost. Last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday where we celebrate when Holy Spirit came to the earth. And before Pentecost happened, I want you to realize uh, the transition that took place in Acts chapter 2. Prior to Acts chapter 2, there were disciples that followed Jesus. So Jesus came and made disciples. There were God-fearing Jews, but then Jesus came to be the embodiment of the Old Testament, the embodiment of the Jewish religion, the completion of everything God began through the Jewish religion. So Jesus comes, the Son of God, upon the earth, and some disciples come to him and begin to follow him, and he begins to train them and send them out two by two, and he begins to, to pour his, his heart and his authority into those believers. Then Jesus is crucified on the cross, He's resurrected. He comes back for 40 days. He, 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 he breathes on his disciples' Holy Spirit. He, he, he encourages them about the kingdom, and then he ascends on up into heaven. At this point, we have disciples of Jesus in a ragtag bunch floating around waiting for something to happen. I love when God says, I'm sending something your way, but he don't tell you what it is. <laughs> it's always dangerous and scary. I mean, I would have freaked out. It was a room full of people with their hair on fire. I mean, I, I, that wasn't exactly what I would have dreamed was going to happen that day. But watch what happens in Acts chapter 2. Holy Spirit comes to the earth, moves into the heart of each believer, and the church is born. And the reason the church is born it's because Jesus was an external God that they could see or follow or not follow. 
But Holy Spirit is the internal God that moves in on the inside. Now, for the first time ever, believers can relate to believers spirit to spirit. Now it's not just our skin color or our personalities or how we grew up, but for the first time ever, the brotherhood is established around the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God came inside each believer, and now there is something I have in common with every other Christian that can never be changed because the same Holy Spirit that's in you is in me. It's the exact same person. And because of that, there's a, there's a common bond there that we can relate to one another. That was benefit number one of Holy Spirit coming is finally we had something eternally in common with one another but the second thing is we were all made uniquely and Holy Spirit gave each of us different gifts not one of us is made complete by ourselves we need other people so he gave us the Holy Spirit that made us common with each other and then he made us different so we had to share with each other because we needed each other how that's that's what the church is the church is the church is when we, we find our commonality around who we are in Christ Jesus before we identify who we are by any other brand. We are Christians before we're Americans. We're Christian before we're white or black. We're Christian before we're Republican or Democrat. We're, we're Christian first because the holy God, the eternal God of heaven lives inside of our heart. Now I can know you by the Spirit, not just know you by the flesh and your culture and your beliefs. So there, there are four elements about community care I want to talk about. Four elements. Number one, there's a spiritual elements. And, and in this passage, it mentions a couple different things. It says that there was apostles teaching. The apostles were preaching the gospel. They got the, 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 the disciples got together for prayer. There were signs and wonders happening. And there were testimonies. The disciples were testifying to the resurrection of Jesus. I was asked in one of my pastor Zooms recently, they said, have you thought of what changes you'll do when you're back into your building again? And I said, one thing I'm going to propose to my team is more use of testimonies. Uh, testimonies are the faithfulness of God in one person's life that stirs up the faith in somebody else's life. And I really believe that in this new season that we need to make room for the brotherhood to encourage the brother that there, there's this, this testifying of this is what God did in my life so that somebody over here having a similar experience can say then I can believe God can do that in my life. That's one thing I believe that we're, we're going to need to look at when we come back is more room for testimonies. So we see, the, we see the apostles preaching. We see the people coming together in prayer. We see signs and wonders. We, we, we see testimonies of the, the resurrection of Christ. There's got to be a spiritual element Whenever the, we are in taking care of our community. So our church, when we come together, there has to be this spiritual element that goes above the service itself. I was in a church service recently. I've been, I've been looking around. I've been spying out the land, getting to go places I don't know. So I was in church a service the other day. And after I went, I was talking to one of my friends. And they said, was the Holy Spirit there? And I said, yes. No. No, Holy Spirit was not there. And then I had to stop and pause for a second. Why did I say, yes, Holy Spirit was there when I really didn't think Holy Spirit was? I felt Holy Spirit, but I didn't even think about it until the person asked me about it. And so what happened is, is the Holy Spirit in me was in the room, but I didn't sense Holy Spirit in the service. Does that make sense? Where I can, go, I can go to the zoo and be with Holy Spirit. I mean, he can convict me or udge nerds me or teach me something at the zoo. But, but I was in the church service, and, and I was trying to, I was looking at the things they were doing well and the things that, uh, that blessed me and seeing from a different perspective. But I didn't feel Holy Spirit moving in the service. He was moving in my heart. And, and one of the things that I believe about being the church, being the local body, is, is that the Spirit has to be seen and the Spirit has to be felt when people walk in these doors. When we get together for meetings out in the community and we pray together or walk together or do worship services together, it's the Spirit. What, what makes the church the church? The church never was the church until Holy Spirit came to the earth. Holy Spirit is the one that makes us the church. Therefore, we have to focus a little bit more in this new season on who is Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit's mm, ways and his works in our lives, in our church. If the church is not walking in the Spirit, it is not being led by the Spirit, it's no different than any other organization. The Bible says that we are to know one another after the Spirit. 
that we are to know who each other are by the Spirit of God in them. And that, if we could see people from the Holy Spirit's value of them, a lot of our conversations about each other would change. A lot of our perspectives, a lot of the, the judgments and things that we say would change if we would focus on Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit's in me is also in them, and God accepts them right where they are. So there's got to be a spiritual element to the, to the church. We see that in the local ch- early church, see it in the local church, and then we see it in our community. Did you know you can take the Spirit of God with you everywhere you go? See, that's part of our job as a local church is to get outside these walls. Okay, let's we'll stop there for a second. So, um, we're deployed right now. See, I, I've been in the Marine Corps, and I've been deployed before. See, you, 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 you spend some time back in garrison doing a bunch of inspections, a, lun- a bunch of PT, run five miles with a big rucksack on your back or something like that. Uh, you do a lot of PT. You do a lot of inspections. You do a lot of training. But that's not why you go into the Marine Corps is to sit on a base and get training. So what happens is at some point there is either a drill or there is a crisis and they will deploy Marines all over the world. It is during deployment you find out whether you were good at your training or whether you wasn't good at your training. It's during deployment you find out if the training actually works or it doesn't work and if you're effective or not effective. We in America have been sitting in church on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock for many years. And the Lord pushed the deployment button, and we are now deployed. Now, now is when we're going to find out whether we learned how to be the church when we were sitting on Sunday morning, now that we're out in combat, now that we're out in community. Are we loving people? Are we, are we being the church? Are we taking care of the widows and orphans? Are we witnessing the people? Are we helping our neighbor? This is that moment where the Spirit in us goes with us out in the community, and we get to serve other people. But we're serving from the Spirit. All right, spirit element. Second, there's a body. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to go spirit, body, soul, or spirit, physical, soul. Because we bring all of us in front of all of Him. So I have Holy Spirit. But I also have a body. And in, in this early, you know, books of Acts, when it talks about the early church, it says that they came together. They were in proximity. The first step to relationship, proximity. They came together. They were in fellowship with each other. They broke bread. Um, they, they got together. You know, one of the things that I like to do is, Tina and I like watching uh, some tra- international travel shows that talk about cooking and stuff. I love when they go to Africa or Europe or maybe to Asia. And, and they, they look at the cuisine and sample different foods. Do you, you see how many cultures are boiled down into their food? I mean, if you eat their food, you can taste their culture. Most cultures have their own food. It's one of the things they use to identify themselves with. So it says the disciples got together house to house, and they broke bread, and they fellowshiped with each other. This last week, I've had a lot of conversations with white leaders and with black leaders. Uh, I've gotten some criticism because me speaking about these things uh, to some people feels like it's a political statement. And I want to say something to you. Uh, Talking about Republican or Democrat and some of all those issues, some of that can be very political, and I stay away from that stuff. Um, Helping minorities who are suffering from racism uh, is not a political issue. It's a human issue. Jesus died for all people. And it is my job as a white majority in America to stand up when a black minority is murdered and when there's systematic uh, injustice in our system. And so I'm going to use this platform for the preaching of the gospel and for protecting of the innocent and for dealing with injustice. Jesus spoke up for women. Jesus spoke up for the widow. He spoke up for the orphan. He spoke up for the poor. The Bible gave the Jews laws on how to treat the aliens when they move through their land. And so part of my job, if I'm going to preach the gospel, I've got to preach a gospel that every soul matters and they have equal value before the Lord. And therefore, if injustice is being done and I can stop it by the preaching of the gospel, I'm going to do that. This is a human issue, not a political issue. I'm going to stay away from all the other things that came with that. I'm going to stay on that human issue right there. My strategy is two things. I am going to educate myself by uh, reading books, by watching videos, and by having conversations. And number two, I am going to build relationships with people that don't look like me, that don't think like me, and that don't have the same experience I have. 
if I can break bread and fellowship with someone who doesn't look like me, and I can see from their point of view, the Bible tells me that I am called to mourn with those that mourn. But if I don't even know their name, how can I mourn with them when injustice is being done in their community? So my job right now is to educate myself. It's not to speak. It's not to come out with a bunch of solutions and answers. My job is to ask questions. My job is to educate myself. And second of all is to build relationships with people that don't look like me so I can try and understand and then use my influence, my platform, my resources to be a power of good in that circumstance. So we, we have a spirit element, but then we have a body element where Man, we're just getting together, eating some good food. We're trying some stuff we never tried before. We're fellowshipping with each other. We're building each other up through stories and relationships. And as that relationship builds, then what they care about, I care about. What I care about, they care about. And I think that that's going to have to be a solution for us as we move forward. I sat in on a Zoom meeting. Our executive staff had a Zoom meeting this week. And we asked someone to come in as a guest. And they told their story. And as they told their story, we could not help but cry and sob listening to that story. And the way our executive staff loved that person and responded to that person, later I I called a couple of our executive staff and I said, you know what, I've never said this before, but I'm more proud of our humanity today than I was of our spirituality. And then the thought crossed my mind, no, it's because of your spirituality that you can be human that you can function in humanity. Listen, let me be as real as I know. If your spiritual walk with God does not make you more human, more compassionate, more kind, and more caring, I think you're going after the wrong religion. I think you've missed Jesus. Jesus cares about people. And as we pursue the Lord and we read the Bible and pray, something should happen to our hearts that we care about humanity a little deeper. Now, you may see things different than I see things. That's fine. That's fine. But, but does your heart care? And, and, and where I'm at, the deeper I get with the Lord, the more the Lord is breaking my heart for people that are struggling and hurting in, w- in a lot of different ways, not just in one way. So there is this spiritual peace, there's this physical peace, and then there is the emotional elements. It says that they were of one heart and one so- a soul. It says they sold their possessions And it says to care for the least among them. And there was no needy among them. And they had glad and generous hearts. I I don't know about you, but I want to join that church. Can you imagine if you started caring about your brothers and sisters to such a degree that you had one heart, you had one soul, you then began to look around and see the needy around you and you said, I can fix that problem. And you took our, your fourth car and you sold it and you gave the money for somebody that had their first car. And, and then there was no needy among you. And then suddenly what came out of that was a glad and generous heart. Man, that sounds like heaven on earth, our future. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like us building relationship one with another to such a degree I can see your needs. See, see, we're good at hiding our needs. We don't want to be needy, and we don't want people to see our needs. So a lot of times we put on that face when we come to church, and we don't show people our needs. I had somebody that's in the room right now that saw me today just for a split second and said, he's not having a good day. And they came to check on me and said, how you doing? I said, fine. How you doing? Then I told them the truth. Because... You're so prone to not tell the truth and when we have a need. Can you imagine being in such relationship with each other that we cared that when we saw a need, it was our need. We, we cared so much about their need that became our need that we said, hey, we have one heart. We have one soul. I have the ability to meet that need. So what if I just went ahead and did that? And it says, and there was no needy among them. Do you remember? It's always puzzled me that Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. Do you understand it's possible to have poor people with you, but not needy? You know, it's possible that some, we can have different, this is not communism, we can have different, uh, different salaries, but what is it like if the poor people in our community knew if they had a need, a legitimate need, somebody would help them. They might, not, oh, they might stay poor, but they wouldn't be needy. Their needs would be met. I just love that the body of Christ is the only ones that can deal with these issues because we know each other after spirit. Now if we share our bodies with each other, share fellowship and food, and then care enough with our heart that we want to help each other's needs, this is what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. And the last thing is supernatural. 
You can have all of that, but until supernatural, synergy is when the sum is greater than the parts. There's, you, you add these pieces together, and then suddenly there's more parts there than what you could have seen because God got into the middle of it. And it says stuff like this. There were, they had favor on all people. There was great grace upon the believers, great power in the church. God added to the church daily, and then 3,000 people even got saved, even got saved in one day. I heard a guy in our church, Ben Mayer, say this before. He says, God is the God that can save 3,000 because God is the God that can feed 5,000. Never save more people than you're able to feed and able to take care of. In this pandemic, I've thought about that a lot. Have we been setting up programs and advertisements and marketing to woo people into the church to grow our numbers? Or have we been trying to win people to Jesus and disciple them and let God add people to the church as he wants to do that. Because I firmly believe this right here. The church's success is measured by what happens outside the building, not inside the building. I believe right now we're being tested, not by the Lord. The Lord already knew where we were. We didn't know where we were. The test is for us to see how we're doing church how we're doing relationships how we're doing in our community and i believe the true measure of our church's success is not found inside these walls by the amount of people that attend here or how much money comes in it's, it's, it's measured by how impactful we are out in our community i've heard several pastors uh, get away with the lord and have a conversation I, I know one pastor jackie white who's out in um uh texas lubbock texas and they were in a building campaign, and he was getting ready to build a big building, and he needed a personal retreat, went away for a couple days. And as he's talking to the Lord about building a new building and about mo raising money, the Lord asked him this question. If your church did not exist, would your community even notice? Would your city even care? It's funny how you go to the Lord on one subject, and he changes it once they have a different conversation. And Jackie said, to be very frank with you, if our church disappeared today, I don't think our community would mourn. I don't think it would have a big impact. I've had several pastors who have said that to me, and each time they do, I ask that question. If New Covenant Church in Clyde, North Carolina, did not exist, would our community notice? And the answer is, they absolutely would notice. We are so ingrained in our community in serving the people of this community in myriad of ways that we would be, it would be noticed if we were not here anymore. That brings me great joy that when someone finds out that I'm from New Covenant, they'll start listening, oh, you, your church helps with this and your church helps with that, your church does this and your church does that, because we don't do all the work of the kingdom in the building, we do the work of the kingdom outside the building, and the Lord had to shut down the building for us to be able to see that. We are thriving as a church. We are thriving in the message that we're preaching. We are thriving in how we're serving the widow, the orphan, the poor, and in our local community. God is on the move. The kingdom is expanding. I'm talking to more pastors, and we're walking in more unity, helping one another than we ever have before. Remarkable. Uh, one of the things that... Um, one of the things you, that we ha did recently is as soon as the pandemic broke out, the EMS talked to one of the pastors and said, we need masks, and church people sew masks. And we got the word out, and church people came in droves and made masks and got them to our EMS workers. Another thing that we did was, was Haywood Christian Ministry has a refrigerated trailer that's been broken for a long time. And it needed $5,000. And one of the pastors found out and asked the other pastors, and just in one Zoom meeting raised $5,000 to get that thing fixed. We were not doing those things before the pandemic. We're doing those things today because we're meeting together because we've never been in these unparalleled times. I, I, wanna, I just want to encourage us right now that, that God made you a beautiful, unique, wonderful person, but he put Holy Spirit inside of you who has the ability to communicate and relate to the Holy Spirit that's the same Holy Spirit in everybody else, all the Christians around you. That commonality gets be beyond skin color. It gets beyond our demographics. That, that commonality allows us to come together. If anyone can deal with racism, it's the church. If anyone can deal with injustice, it's the church because we can identify with one another, not just on a human level, but on a supernatural level, on a deity level with the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. 
Then he gave us different giftings so we, we'd have to need one another. and We'd have something to give and something to receive. And then he brings us together in, in, in one congregation so that we can have relationships and do growth group with one another and fellowship and eat bread. And then he puts us in a community and says, now care for that community. That's your Garden of Eden. I want you to, to make it beautiful again and offer it to me as a gift when I return. I want you to advance the kingdom and stomp out injustice and heal this earth and bring joy to the people of this world and bring me a gift when I return back to this earth again. That's our job. And so I'm hoping through this sermon series that you're finding your place in all that. I believe at New Covenant we're getting some new strategies of what God wants to do moving forward, moving into the future. We're not going to be moving back. We're going to be moving into the future. And I hope you're ready and prepared for that because God is definitely on the move. All right, that's it for this week. I want to encourage you that if you're here today and you would like to leave a prayer request, just please go on newcovenantchurch.com, click on the connect button. Uh, If you'll leave a prayer request, we'll be glad to pray over that. Also, if you're here today and maybe uh, you need some ministry, maybe something I've said today is Holy Spirit has poked something in your heart and you need to process that, you can go on newcovenantchurch.com, you can click on that button, and you can give us your name and phone number, and somebody will call you within the next 24 hours. Before we wrap up, I want to pray for you. Last week was a hard week. I'm going to pray this week is much better. That, that as, we, as we're starting to unpack the layers of problems, I'm going to ask God to now start unpacking the different strategies that we need to lean into as we move forward. So, Papa, I just lift us up. I ask for your grace, supernatural mercy. Papa, we're asking for wisdom beyond our years. We're asking for a new breath, a, a, a new breath in our sail, God. So new energy and strength to move forward and to speak to some of these things. Help us not to judge other people when their assignment is different than our assignment. Help us just to find out what we're supposed to do and leave everybody else alone that's doing something different. And I'm just asking God for supernatural breakthrough in, in, our, in our communities. May 2020 be the year marked in history that everything churned, everything began to heal, every knee began to bow, everything began to be done different in 2020. That's when it all started. God put his finger on it. May we be the generation that steps up and says, yes, sir, we will do your will. We'll advance your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.